Thanks again, guys, for coming. Um, just want to give you a bit of an uh, idea on what we're going to talk about today, right? So it's an introduction to sports business. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, this. What, what, who's this course for? I think it's important to, to qualify who, who's this for and not who doesn't really need this, right? So I suppose this is for anyone with a love for sport, I think, and uh, also interest in starting their own business. I think that's a good starting point. You need to have passion. You need to have passion to start anything. Uh, if you know, some of us, if you say, let's go do knitting, I don't think so anybody's interested, right? So you're not going to really make a big business out of it. So I suppose you need to have that. Uh, passionate people who are in need of uh, career change. Uh, we spoke about that earlier. Uh, potentially, who knows? Um, maybe after this, after tonight's uh, little training here, you might change your mind to say, you know what, I want to deep dive into the sports business and what it has to offer. Uh, budding entrepreneurs who want to pursue opportunities in the sports related field um, I've been very very lucky to um, I mean I don't want to go into the cliche and say that I never worked in my life but I did work I worked very hard but uh, the good thing is that it is it's not really work because a lot of it is play as well so so which is fun which I'll share more <coughs> but who is not this for right this is definitely not for uh, students who have no interest or passion for sport because I think that's a starting point if you don't have that then again very hard to get into it Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. Right? The reason why I want to tell you about my story is not really to, to, to brag and feel big about myself. It's to also tell you where I started, where I, I came from and, and where I am today. So it gives you a bit of context to all I've done. And it's 15 years of uh, experience that I have that I'm trying to share within a space of, say, what, 45 minutes. Okay, so former Singapore national player, uh, pro athlete. Um, I've, uh, I scored a goal once. Uh, that really, really changed my life. Um, I actually wrote uh, 15 blog posts on LinkedIn um, the last 15 weeks about how I've actually taken um, lessons from football into building my business. Um, and ep at every point that I found challenges in my business world, I didn't know where the reference point was because I was only an athlete. I, didn't, I was not in the corporate world where I had professional training on how to man manage or HR or marketing, I didn't know that. Uh, a lot of it came from real life experience, being around a team dynamics. That's all I did all my life, be around a team. So I harnessed a lot of that, that um, lessons that I learned and I applied it in business. And a lot of it is so real and a lot of it is, um, it's, a lot of people don't get it, but if you are an athlete, you, you, you know what it means to be with a team every day, day in, day out, travel with them, eat and sleep and you know, uh, almost go to war with them. So I, that, that, that's a lot of stuff to actually learn. Uh, I won many championships in my life. Um, and, you know, um, I played with a lot of top players. A lot of top players that actually went to the World Cup, played for their national team. And they showed me what professionalism is. And even until today, I, I reflect back on the things I actually learned from them, um, on how they actually sort of projected the professionalism. And I, as a young boy, picked it up and that probably stayed with me for a lot of my life. Um, then I transitioned into being an entrepreneur um, upon retirement from um, football. I had a decision to make. Do I, do I work for someone? Do I um, start on my own? Actually, when I finished um, playing, I really didn't know what to do. I mean, the natural progression is to become a coach, right? Everybody, that's what they do, become a coach or a manager. But I didn't really want to do that because I knew that I had a bit more in me than just being a coach. While being a coach is a, is, a, is a great job, but I wanted to do more than just become a coach. So here I am. So I was featured on BBC uh, talking about uh, sports business in Asia, um, specifically with regards to Asian games and stuff like that, the business of sports. And I think this was also a, a great moment for me because this is also a validation of your expertise in the marketplace. Uh, BBC just don't call anybody to come and sit on the couch and talk about something. Uh, very, very serious media, as we all know. So that was me. I won the Pentagon Award for the entrepreneur footballer, um, someone who's transitioned well from sports um, to being an entrepreneur. I won that award at the same award uh, at the same ceremony. The Prince of Johor uh, won an award for being the most inspirational character in sport. Um, so it was quite a high high-powered sort of award and I was really, really, really pleased. And my first entrepreneurial award in, in that sense, so I was really pleased to be there. 
Also in 2011, I won what we won as an agency, uh, the best event concept. We came up with a concept for the World Cup and actually won a marketing award for it, uh, which I'm really proud of. Um, being an independent agency, being a small agency, uh, we kicked, we, and we really punched above our weight and actually won an award there. Um, today, I, I'm probably a, a key opinion leader in, uh, in sports and especially in football. The media likes to uh, call me and ask for quotes because I'm quite colorful when I actually speak. I, I say what I like and I, I say what I feel is true. So I'm very authentic with my, my comments. Most of the time rubs people the wrong way, so be it. Uh, but I'm just being authentic. And I always tell that uh, facts, I don't make up stories. I don't like to make up stories. I just call it as it is. Um, just because I think, um, again, when you look at the marketplace today, there's no authenticity. Everybody so speaks from a script. Right, everybody speaks from a script. So when you don't speak from a script, so I suppose you stand out. So that really helped me also building my business and the profile. So I launched Red Cut Global, my marketing agency, sports marketing agency, back in 2005. I remember very clearly September. Um, it all started because I couldn't find a job. I came back from Australia. Right after I retired, I went to Australia. I was working for a while. I came back and I was looking for a job. I went for multiple interviews. Um, in the sports field, nobody gave me a job. Uh, three months into it, I was getting a little bit worried, right? Um, and I was thinking, you know, is there, wh what am I gonna do? So I thought, you know, if I can't find a job, I'll create a job. And that's why I started my agency. I, I, I looked at the sports business being the low cost of entry. Uh, there was no barrier for me to enter because I had my network, I had everything. So I thought the transition would be smooth. So I, I entered that. Uh, literally started my business with a credit card. I uh, went to the, business registry and I just registered the business and three days later I was ready to run um, and uh, I remember my first office was a shared office one table space and we shared it with uh, I had another guy working for me part-time so half a day I'll be there and another half a day he'll be there and I'll be sitting in the in the cafe uh, smashing out the PowerPoint proposals and stuff like that so that's how we started and grew the business to about 5 million in uh, 2015 and grew my team to about 30 in three different countries. So where we started in 2005, 10 years later, I actually grew the business to about 5 million. So, and then in 2016, what I did was, like any entrepreneur would want to do, I actually sold part of my business to a big Japanese MNC for eight figures. So that was a full circle that came together, which was really, really pleasing. You work hard, you know, being an entrepreneur is not easy. It is a journey. It is something that you, commit to and you, and you work at it. So 10 years later, I, you know, I, I had a big payout in the end. So it was, was nice, but that's about me. So like I said, this is just to inspire you a little bit because um, there's a common myth that you must have all the resources before you start. You must find the right moment to start. Uh, you must have all the backing, everything that you need to start. Um, I'm a great example. I had nothing before I started. Um, and I was coming into a space where there are a lot of players at the time, a lot of big players from Europe, Japan, uh, all the big MNCs were here, people looking at me and going like, you know, are you sure this guy is going to do it? Uh, I've seen many cycles in terms of recession and all that stuff, and I've seen a lot of them actually come and go. So I had the hindsight to stay, stay the course, and we are here today, right? So that's so much about me, but more importantly, what will you learn here today? I think three things that's key for you to take away today. A is introduction to the sports business. What is sports business? Um, maybe you guys have a, a rough idea of what it is, but I want to deep dive into it, give you uh, maybe under the hood sort of a look into what the sports business is. Uh, opportunities in the sports business, I think that's key. Um, everybody wants to know how can I make money, right? How can I leverage on this? Uh, the contacts you have, the network you have, the passion and interest, how can you do that? And developing a thriving sports business. I think these three key takeaways is something that I'm looking to pass on. So. Hopefully, you guys get good value out of it. More importantly, if you've got any questions, write it down. At the end, we can spend half an hour talking about it. I'm here to answer all your questions. So, Shakir Neil. So, he said, I'm tired of hearing about money, money, and money, right? As a basketball player. But then he goes on to say, I just want to play the game, drink Pepsi, and wear Reebok. So, you can see that the game has sort of evolved from where it started, where people used to play for passion, right? Um, back in the days, we used to say, just play for passion and that was it. Then the professional era came. 
where everything was about the money, not so much about the passion. Passion was a byproduct, but the money took over. The commercial guys started coming, the brands came to, to be part of sports. And there you go. Every aspect of sports, in, especially in America, where they are a bit more advanced than other parts of the world, they know how to commercialize business, they know how to bring brands into business, and they're top of the game when it comes to that. So there's a lot to learn from, and Shaquille O'Neal says it nice, right? He says, they complain about the money, but at the end of the day, they have to do it, right? That's why I took this um, um, sort of quote, right? So there are two aspects to this. Marketing of sports versus marketing to sports. Okay, I'll go into it and i explain. There are two different aspects to sports. So marketing of sports is now you are marketing sports as a product. Then the flip side of it is marketing to sports, using sports as a medium. We'll talk a deep dive more into it. So what do I, what do I really mean by that? Events. So we took look at the FIFA World Cup. We look at the Olympic Games. We look at uh, Asian Games. We look at all the major games that happen in the world. These are events that uh, are marketed to the masses. Teams. Uh, no surprise, Manchester United, Liverpool, Real Madrid, Barcelona, uh, you name it, the teams are highly popular in this part of the world and the rest of the world as well. So they have now become global brands. So that is the marketing of the teams. The teams that do more are actually getting in front. If you look at Manchester United, probably have the biggest revenue in terms of commercial partners around the world. They have a 40-man team sitting out of uh, London. Now they have opened up an office in Hong Kong. Uh, to leverage more on their brand and to you know, make sure that they more bring more commercial partners so that they can go on and sign bigger and better players, right? Then you've got athletes. Uh, some of the most marketable ath athletes in the world, Cristiano Ronaldo, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, uh, Tiger Woods before, and you look at Michelle Wee, the golfer. So the list goes on, right? So um, athletes have now also become a brand. Um, brands want to leverage using them. Leagues. English Premier League has to be the biggest league in the world now. But if you, we go further, we look at uh, American sports, uh, NBA, uh, NFL, and all of these, the, the multi, multi millions going into the billions as well. So they are now also marketing sports because they do such a great job in terms of marketing and really harnessing the passion of fans now become a global brand. So now we look to marketing through sports. Um, so what does that really mean? Marketing through sports, advertising a non-sports product while using sports as a medium. So this guy by far, Cristiano Ronaldo, is becoming um, one of the biggest names in world sports now, right? And every brand imaginable is using him to market. Now, when you look at all the, uh, the brands there, uh, it's quite funny to see KFC uh, also there. And uh, you would imagine that KFC is so unhealthy, but what they are doing is that they're trying to harness the image of Cristiano Ronaldo to make it uh, more popular. He's a fit guy, he's strong, so he's actually they, they borrowing credibility for someone. Otherwise, they don't belong in the sports space. KFC chicken and sports don't mix together, right? but they're leveraging credibility there. So um, this is marketing through sports. We've seen multiple examples. right? Um, um, we, we look at even women coming into sports now. Um, brands that only reach out to women, now they're using them as ambassadors to empower women around, all the brands that are coming. So the women in, in sports, is a, it's a big space that's growing now. More and more women are getting into, into the sports space or brands coming into the women's sports and in, in terms of even participation. If you look in the US, the biggest um, grassroots sports activity is actually football. Uh, you've got a lot of number of uh, girls that are actually playing football at a grass, grassroots level. So let's move into the consumer, sports consumer versus uh, sports product. So this is, it, it's important to, to, to figure this one out. So on, on the left, you see fans, you, lead, uh, you see participants, you see sponsors. So they're broken up into three categories. Uh, these are the consumers of sports. What are the products and benefits? So when you look at the sports fan, you look at sporting events, you look at merchandise, and you look at sports information. So this is how they consume as fans. Why do they do that? It's because they want social identity, right? If you talk to a Liverpool fan today, he, even though they're living um, millions of miles away, they feel so passionate about Liverpool, so much those, they say that, you know, I'm not born in Liverpool, but I am Liverpool, that kind of stuff, right? Because they form this bond and they form this social identity. And that's the reason why sports have become really, really powerful. Now we look at the participants. 
sporting goods and mass participation. So in terms of participants, they need to go out there, they need to buy the yoga pilates, they need to buy the running shoes, they need to buy the football to play, all the equipment that you can actually think of, uh, sporting goods that you can think of, they consume that for mass participation. We look at all the mass participation events that happen in amateur sports, marathons, uh, football events, hockey events, swimming, cycling now, uh, all of those. So why? It's because they want to create this personal experience. Right, that's about that. When you participate in sports, you're creating your personal experience. And for the sponsors who are actually equally as important, what happens there is they get naming rights and product placement. So we've seen in many instances where we saw, like for example, like uh, Ronaldo with KFC or even with Nike, with Adidas, and all the different brands, they, they place their product in terms of endorsement, right? So in a big match happening, Ronaldo is wearing a pair of boots, Nike boots, that's actually placement. When we look at naming rights, uh, we can name hundreds and hundreds of different sponsors that have actually backed events, like the Formula One. Uh, you look at uh, all the other events that happen, um, all of them have some sort of naming rights behind it. If you look at uh, some time ago, um, Barclays was a sponsor of the Premier League. Uh, so they brought borrowed cred credibility from that, they bought into naming rights, now they have assets to execute now. So they have touch points for them to now get into the sports, now they can go directly to the consumer now because it's a big base, right? So what do they get in front of them? Is corporate image. Um, a lot of the times, like when you look at um, not so healthy products like, like KFC, they leverage on credibility of sports to change the image. So it's not all bad sometimes. Like McDonald's is a big supporter of the Olympics. Coca-Cola. So when you think about all these brands that are actually counterproductive of sports, you drink enough Coca-Cola, you get fat. You eat enough fast food, you get seriously unhealthy. But why do they have a space in sports? Because they can lend credibility, can they, they can borrow le uh, credibility, they can leverage it, and they can send a message differently. Whereas if traditional advertising, they don't, they don't create a cult-like following. But now, because of sports, you target the heartstrings of fans. Now you have, suddenly you have an opportunity to engage with them on a different level. And that's what the beauty of sports is. So you might want to take this down because this is very key. So the opportunities in the sports business. So the sports industry is now related to the products and services offered to customers. We now can actually break that into three components. This is called segmentation of the industry, right? So there are three segments. You look at the sports performance, um, which, which then leads us to stuff like the, the athletics part of it, um, amateur sport, it can be broken down into, when we, when we say athletics, it actually mean the actual events, the, the actual sport that's happening. You can break that down into two things, amateur and professional. Then you've got tech supported. What do you mean by tech supported? When you look at a lot of um, associations around the world, they're supported by taxpayers' money. Uh, any national association and all that, they are backed by our tax money. Right? So you look at that, then you look at membership supported organizations. For, for example, like a country club, right? If you, are, you belong to a golf club, and these are all membership-based, right? And non-profit organizations. There are a lot of non-profit organizations who are involved in sports as well, and, and, and sports education. So when you look at the, the sports performance side of it, and this is how it's actually broken down. So it's important for you to understand this is because that's where you start finding opportunities in the sports business. If you want to be involved in the amateur sports, if you want to be involved in professional sports, um, if you want to be involved in, in, a, in a national sports association. Um, so this is how it's broken up. Sports production, what does it mean? Sports products needed, desired for production, influence the quality of the sports performance. Mostly apparel, outfitting products, equipment, apparel. Right? One of the latest entry into the, um, in the, into the space of apparel, apparel that's taking over the world is Under Armour. Right? Um, Kevin Plank, the CEO, when you listen to him, he goes to say that he tried to fill a gap in the marketplace because the uh, NFL players were wearing material that didn't really help them with performance on the pitch. And what he did was, in his own garage, he started experimenting with equipment or rather apparel that could fit the marketplace because he understood the ecosystem. Right? He knew exactly where to go and he did his research and plus the fact that he actually had some friends who played in the NFL and he said, hey, would you mind wearing this. And then when the guy liked it and say, can you pick this up and give it to the guy next 
to you in the locker room. And that's how his business boom. So why I say this is because it's important for you to understand the marketplace where you want to play. With it, is it from a performance perspective, from a production perspective? Uh, then you can be a bit more educated uh, with your entry to the marketplace. So you look at all the other stuff, of course, medical center, physiotherapists and stuff like the fitness trainers, which is a big space as well, gyms, personal trainers. Uh, you look at sports facilities, you know that there's a lot of sports facilities mushrooming up, futsal courts, tennis courts, uh, driving range. Now they have even have golf simulation. You don't really need to go to a real um, golf facility now. It's all uh, computerized. You just hit it and it actually tells you how far you go. So you can see the evolution of something that was very traditional. They have taken it to the digital space. So you can start asking questions to yourself. What is traditional? Can we now look at the opportunities in business to now digitalize that? Right? Then you look at uh, sports facilities and governing bodies and officials. You might want to become a official uh, with the governing body. Whichever sport you, that you are interested in, start as a volunteer and slowly going up uh, through the ladder and now doing, giving something back to the sport that you like. So that's an opportunity. So the third segment is actually the promotion side, which is it's quite exciting and probably is something that uh, I've done most of my life. When you look at the promotional merchandising products, promotional activities, media, uh, sponsorship, um, not just for teams. Now you can start selling sponsorship for leagues. You can start sp uh, selling sponsorship for players, uh, venue, um, all sorts of stuff. Being creative, you can now start thinking about what you can do with various things, right? So th that's an opportunity that lies within the sports business. So of course, non-specific sports use as well. So um, there are facilities that are multi-sport, or uh, also for um, can become a concert venue, right? You can set up a amphitheater that you say that hey, um, from this hour to this hour they are doing sports, and after that you change it into a auditorium for lectures or you can turn it into into a, a, a concert space who knows this is up to your imagination but these are three segments that the sports business can offer so pay attention to this and maybe you can refer back and we've got any questions that you want to ask you can always come back and ask me about these questions right so again sports industry segmentation from a performance production and promotion side i've spent a lot of my time in the promotion side um, I've, I've been in a bit of the performance side. I've, I've got my ba basic uh, uh, coaching, coaching badge. And today I volunteer with, a, with one of my, my clubs uh, as an assistant coach and a team manager. So I, I stay in the, in, in the game with performance. But for the last 15 years, I've been involved in the, in the promotion side. Um, from a media perspective, I was a pundit on TV. I, we have our own uh, media. We created digital channels. We create uh, our own content. Uh, to reach out to the marketplace. So that's something that you might want to think about. So why get into the sports business? But I think sports business offers several opportunities along the niche and area of specialization. So each one of you probably have uh, your own uh, specialization. You could be HR, you could be marketing, you could be sales, uh, you could be operational, you could be anything, right? When you have that um, area of speciality, the barrier to entry into the sports business is quite easy. You just need to find your space within it. So the options of choosing from sports promotion, advertising to owning a sports facility. Like I said, we looked through all the different segmentation. So there's real opportunities there for you to get in. And that's what makes the sports business really exciting. So when I started, I, I looked at the, at, at the marketplace and I said, where, where, where can I start? Where can I really start? Right. So I looked at saying, what requires the least amount of investment? but gives me the high uh, return. So I took the route of being a, a, a manager, a, a talent scout, a football agent, whatever you want to call it, because I didn't need to invest anything. I only had to use my own network. I had to use my own interpersonal skills of dealing with people, signing up a player, creating that trust, the credibility, and reaching out to, to, to teams that wanted players like that. I used my expertise. So I, I leveraged on my speciality, and I looked at my, my network and I created a business out of it. At some stage, I was managing about 40 players. It was quite a lot. It was basically babysitting, but it was fun. Uh, so you can afford to start small. Like I said, you can afford to start small and grow the business within a period of time to become a multi-million dollar business like I've done over a space, a space of 10 years. But you need to be very sure that what you want to... Of course, the business evolves a long time. Over time, it evolves. You only change and you get better and better at it but you need to understand which segment that you want to play. 
either promotions, performance, or product. You don't keep jumping from one to the other, then you don't find your, your expertise in it. Because you need to be known for one thing, not many things. So, my secret. So now we actually get into the actual execution part. So my secret of building a successful sports business. I have a, a few tips, five tips, with very little money or no money at all. Okay, so I gave you a, a, a hint earlier. Start from home. Okay, seems simple, seems uh, logic. Uh, but one of the things that really kills businesses is the overheads. It is not cheap to run an operation. You've got to pay uh, bills, you've got to pay rent, you've got to pay utilities, you've got to buy equipment. So the simple thing is that as much as it's sexy and it's really tempting to come and stay in, I mean, have an office space, until you hit a critical mass in terms of revenue, never ever commit yourself to a office space. Work remotely. And the best part is today, now they have co-working spaces that you can be very flexible about. Uh, I know some, some of you, it's really hard to work from home because the bed is calling all the time. You want to just go and sleep for a bit or you know, stuff like that. Uh, I used to do this. I mean, when I used to have Skype calls, I, I used to be in shorts and, and, and I used to wear a jacket on top on the Skype call, but I was just uh, you know, in my home clothes. But eventually I moved out because I, I needed a bit more uh, focus. I needed to have a purpose to get out of bed, get out home and go to, to an office space. So I shared it with, uh, with another friend of mine who was on his own. Uh, even though the office space was $300, we were paying $150. At that time, it looked like a lot of money. So trust me, start from home. Uh, think before you spend on anything. If you want to buy files, pen, you want to buy staplers, no. You can go to events, you can pick up paper, you can pick up everything. You really, really need to penny pinch on everything to make sure that you think before you really buy. Uh, do you really need this, um, um, for example, computer? I was listening to a really interesting podcast the other day. One of the companies, I can't remember now, it was really interesting because uh, this was in the US. Uh, one of the, I think it's Walmart or some, one of them, had this 30-day money-back guarantee. So you could actually buy something from them and 30 days later, bring it back to them. So these guys were quite, quite uh, clever. They rang up uh, one of these uh, Walmarts or Target or whatever and said, uh, what about laptops or computers? Do you have a 30-day back money, uh, 30 day money back guarantee? They said everything there. So what they did was they went there, they bought it, bought it off their credit card. And 30 days, they actually created revenue out of it. And at the end of the 29th day, they turned it back again. Then they did it all over again for a few months. So they were quite creative about it. I'm, I'm not recommending you do that, but you see, you can see that how they actually started their business. Very smart. Uh, so they sort of gamed the system, right? They gamed the system and they found the loophole and they leveraged on it, right? So, so these are things that you really need to do. Learn to barter, okay? So look at all your network, look at everybody that's around you. How can they help you and how can you help them? Uh, there's a certain skill set they, they'll be looking to you to help. Uh, you might be a HR person or you might be a marketing person who'll be able to give somebody else something in return for a favor, right? So look around, go wide, and, and the, the best part is because the digital space allows you to connect with anyone. If you go on LinkedIn, you can connect with anyone. Right, so you look for the, the weakness that you have and then you, you, you go out to the marketplace and look for it. Start small. Uh, don't go hiring people until you know that money's in the bank. Okay, pay yourself first <laughs> instead of hiring someone. And be creative. When I say be creative, it's because um, over the years, how I've actually built a business is I've always looked at a, a product from a different point of view. When somebody looks at a, a, a sporting event or a, um, a ride, and they look at it from one dimension. I always looked at it from a different dimension. I'll give you an example. I had this idea of setting up a radio station all my life. I don't know why, but I had this urge to set up a radio station. And, um, and I'm a big fan of BBC TalkSport and all that. So one day I happened to stumble upon TalkSport. And TalkSport are the, one of the biggest uh, sports radio station in, in the UK. And they're now gone global. They, they had these rights to the English Premier League, audio rights. And I had this outrageous dream that I'm going to start a radio station. We're going to get the rights for um, the English Premier League and set up my own radio station and transmit and get um, fans, right? So when I first shared this idea with a lot of people, they say, come on, man, you, you're dreaming. You, you don't know anything about radio. You've been on radio, but you don't know how it works. So I, I literally put up a PowerPoint proposal mm -hmm. in my mind. I put, translated into a PowerPoint pr uh, um, presentation on what I think will be the radio station. I did extensive research for two months, deep dive into and see, learn everything I could. And what I did was I actually sold 
a radio station idea to start up at the time, which is a big telco, um, for multi-millions. So I actually purchased the rights from Talksport. I packaged everything together. I put up a radio station, and I sold, sold it to uh, a big telco. Um, so that was only possible because I was creative. If I had just looked at it from a one dimension, um, I was, I'm not a big conglomerate. I'm not a guy that has a big background in radio. I could have never achieved it. So the whole idea is take one subject matter and look at it from a different direction and, and really train yourself, really push yourself to be creative about the whole process. I think it's very important to create an action plan. So how do you write an action plan? Because when you're a boss, you're not accountable to anyone. You're only accountable to yourself. And a lot of time what happens is that you forget about what you're supposed to do. What's your purpose? Why you are here? Because you're just involved in the grind. So writing a, 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 an action plan is really, really important. So how do you do that? Identify major goals, right? What are your major goals? What are your major milestones that you need to achieve? Looks mundane, looks repetitive. You, you think, yeah, I know. It's amazing the amount of people who actually don't do it, right? Until today, uh, I write down my, my, my major goals I need to achieve for the week, for the month, for the year, and I track it. Create a task list, what needs to be done every day, every hour. Are you accountable? Um, every hour when you're your own boss is income. Every hour you're not selling, you're not feeding yourself or your family or whoever depends on you. So you need to have accountability. Your task list becomes even more important then. Assess your skill set and outsource the rest. Right? When I was in, in the beginning, I had a real problem with graphic design. I couldn't design. Uh, Truth be told, I couldn't even do a PowerPoint presentation back in 2005. Uh, don't forget, I was a footballer for most of my life. Right? The brains don't work when you don't <laughs> really uh, practice it. So uh, I had to really learn. I re had to really learn how to do PowerPoints. And today I can say, by the way, this PowerPoint is all done by me. So I'm quite proud of myself. So I've come a long way. But you look at the skill sets you have, and then you outsource the rest. Um, if it's video production or graphic design, you can't do it. And don't try to do something that you're not good at. Again, barter. Like outsource barter, coming back to the other point, and make sure that you bring the best possible quality into your work, even though you don't have the skill sets. List action items. What I need to do is like a task list, but actionable items. Not like uh, I need to read a book. No, it's not that. I need to read 10 pages today by this time. I need to make 10 phone calls, sales phone calls by this afternoon at this time. Actionable items, right? Update your status. Not your Facebook or Twitter status. Huh? It's your own status. Where are you in your life? Where are you in your, in your part of your journey to become a sports entrepreneur? And prioritize list. We are inundated. We are overwhelmed with a lot of things that are happening in our life and in our business and everything else. That we, we just got too many things going on now. So how do we prioritize this list? We look at tasks. Only one thing should be on your mind, revenue. When you're starting your business, only one thing, revenue, revenue, revenue. So every task you undertake must be revenue driven, or at least it should take one step closer to your revenue goals. Get feedback. It's very important to have someone like a mentor, and you go back to them and say, this is my plan. Uh, I wish, I, si I sincerely wish I had a mentor when I was starting out. Uh, there was no one in the marketplace that was willing to teach me. Uh, partly it's also my fault because I didn't reach out. My ego was too big. Uh, I thought I knew everything, I will do it on my own. But if I can go back in time, and if I know what I know now, what I'll basically do is to make sure that I find a mentor who can actually mentor me, give me valuable feedback, critical um, you know, um, criticism, positive criticism on, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Put the ego aside, learn. Right? I think that's, re that's really key. And monitor results. Are you getting to where you are? And don't brush it aside. If I don't make this sale this week and you say, oh, you know what, it's okay, I will get it. No, monitor the results. Did you do this to get this? If the answer is no, then go back and say, where, where did you go wrong? I think that's key. So the action plan, more than anything, is more important than your business plan, in my opinion. Business plan are numbers, but this will take you one step closer to what you need to do. And this is something that you can action tomorrow. You take this away, you got all your notes. Tomorrow you can try and implement this in your, in your life and see how that makes a change. So how do we now next move to the next step? How do we now develop a profitable sports business? Identify and define. We saw the segmentation earlier. Three segments. Where do you want to go? Do you want to be in the performance product or promotion? Where do you want to be? 
identify and look at your skill set, look at your um, connections, your network, and look at your own passion inwards and say, what can I be good at now? Then do a market research. It's really, really important to do market research because you can start something that you feel that it's a great product or a great pr service and whatever, but the marketplace um, doesn't, doesn't want it. I'll give you an example. The best way to validate your, your market research or your idea is talk to your, your, your closest friends. You come up with an idea, go to them and say, hey, um, how do you validate? Uh, what do you think? I've got this great idea, blah, blah, blah. A lot of the times, bef because people don't want to hurt your feeling, they say, hey, yeah, that's a great idea. But the best way to test is say, okay, I want you to buy the product now and give me your money now. If you think it's a great idea, give me the money now. And then you get the real answer. Then you get the real answer. Uh, so market research is very, very important. There are, there are multiple ways that you can do it today because of the internet. There's a lot of data that's open out there that you can actually go out there and purchase or you can, you can get for, for almost nothing. It only depends on how hard you want to work in getting those numbers. Uh, check out the competition. Um, it's always easy to start a restaurant next to another restaurant. Uh, it's always easy to go somewhere where there's a, a big demand for it rather than trying to be isolated on your own. Um, as much as you want to create this exclusiveness, but it's always important to ensure that there's a marketplace for it. There's enough people in the marketplace that the competition cannot handle, the, s the, the spillover is going to come to you. I used to position myself all the time, always with the big agencies where the work is overwhelming and I'm always there waiting to pick up the, f uh, pick up the, uh, the business out of them because they know that um, I'm reliable, I'm credible, and I'll, I will, I'll give them results. That's all. They, they give me that because they are a big machinery. They can't take everything. They can't monopolize everything. They need to farm it out to someone. So I was always positioning myself next to them. Hire the right team at the right moment. Um, this is something that even at, at the, you know, after 15 years in business, I also make mistakes with. I, I find that really hard to uh, make the right decision at the right time. It only comes with time. You've got to experiment. But most importantly, hiring the right team means the team that can support your weakness. You don't need another you. You need uh, somebody else who's not you. Somebody who's got the skill sets that you don't have. And it takes time to find the right people. So don't rush into it. Make sure that whoever's coming into your business is going to add value and take your business forward together with you. Never ever forget, you are a marketer first. You are a marketer first before you do anything. Whenever I ask an entrepreneur, what are you? What do you do? He says, I, uh, I do this, I sell this, I sell this. I say, well, forget about all of that. First of all, you're a marketer. You can have the best product in the world. If nobody knows about it, you're not selling anything. So you got to put on this mindset that you are a marketing person first. Today, social media allows you to do so many things. You can write blog posts. I'll give you an example. The blog posts I used to write, 15, I mean 15 ar different articles that I wrote. I never even imagined in my wildest dream the people that actually reached out to me because of that. Because somebody likes it, another network of people saw that some, this guy liked it and he went on to the stuff. People from Liverpool Football Club, FIFA, many other organizations, because I can see the analytics behind. I can see the data, who clicked on it, who, lo who looked at my profile and stuff like that. Just by writing three to 500 words, the amount of reach I got for free was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. So that is something that you really cannot underestimate. Be an expert in your field and make sure that you're always putting yourself out there. Always putting yourself out there properly, of course, ethically. Okay, not misrepresenting or uh, making up stuff. No fake news, please. <laughs> you know, all of that stuff, right? So always think about yourself as a marketer first. Timing. So I think this is really important. Again, if I can go back in time, I might do this differently because um, I leapt with no backing. That means I had to make the business work. Otherwise, I don't feed myself. I don't be feed my family. My advice to a, a budding sports business entrepreneurs is that build something as a side hustle first. Keep your day job, do something on the side first. Until your side hustle can actually support your day job, then you dive in full time. Because when you are in a point of desperation, you make silly, silly mistakes. And you, your decisions you make might not actually lead you to your goal. So timing is everything. Right, so it's really important to think about such things. So there are a lot of experts that have this myth about sports business, right? Every expert will tell you, um, do this, do that. So I want to dispel the myth. So I want to give you a, a, a clarity, right? Only athletes and coaches are the most common jobs, right? 
even I thought so too, right? When I retired, I said, hey, I must be, must be a coach. If I'm an athlete, I must be a coach. That's not true. I made a different, different life for myself. From a sports administrator, sports marketing, I eventually did my master's in, in sports business. Never imagined I, I, I saw that. And even now, when the younger athletes or anybody coming into business have a different view because they know that they can get into different... You can become a sports presenter, you can become a pundit, you can become a writer. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot. So in the past, people used to think that just that, that's, that's, that's it. You have to have a, a, you'd have to be a sports genius to survive in this field. Like you must know everything, every game, every stats, everything. No, not true. Uh, not true. I've seen many people that who have actually been in the sports business. Uh, they know something, they're passionate about it, they have an interest, but they don't know everything about sports. So that's one myth. Uh, you hang out with pro athletes all day, every day. Yeah, it's a nice, nice little thing. Yeah, I've had um, fun times as well. I managed to meet some of the top players in the world, like David Beckham. I met. Uh, the list goes on. Over the last uh, uh, 15 years, I've met some really top celebrities, players, people that I uh, otherwise won't meet. I was invited to the Professional Footballers Association uh, Awards Night in London once. I took a bunch of photos with everyone. It's great. That's a perk of being in, in the business. You meet. Uh, I met Ben Johnson once. I mean, how cool is that, right? So I met Ben Johnson once, and uh, these kind of things happen. Uh, but let me tell you, it's not it's not uh, like that every day, right? People think that it's, it's a great job and you do that every day. It's not. It's a nine to five job, and there's nothing nine to five about my job. I can tell you that for a fact. Uh, the the good part is because in sports it starts at different time. Events start at different moments. Uh, clients' needs and everything is different. So it is not a nine to five job like you are used to it now. Uh, it's very flexible. You have to we work on weekends. One of the strange things ever happened to me was we had an intern years ago. She came up to me and she, after just two days, she came up to me and said, she said, um, I can't work on the weekends and I don't want to work on events. So I said, that's a strange request, but given that we only work on the weekend and we only work on e uh, uh, events. So, so she didn't last there too long. So uh, that, that's the kind of thing that happens, right? So it's not a nine to five job. Common myth as well, if you can get in, you're going to get really rich, um, right? You get rich. Uh, you're going to be extremely lucky. For example, you manage a player. Uh, example, the next best thing on earth, and then he creates this move to Real Madrid or Barcelona, and then you become his manager, and yeah, great, fairy tale. But the rest of us have to work. We have to work very hard. Uh, you can see my journey. It took me 10 years to actually get come full cycle with the business itself. And along the way, a lot of failures, a lot of heartaches, a lot of nightmares, a lot of sleepless nights. But that comes with the territory of being an entrepreneur in any any business, not just in the sports business. So the trends and competition myth, myth, sorry, the evolution of sports media. We know today social media is taking over. Nobody ever imagined that someone like a Facebook will go and buy uh, sports rights. It's happening now. Uh, Amazon buying NFL um, Thursday night rights, if I'm not wrong. So you never imagine these non-traditional sports players uh, um, are now buying rights. So there's an evolution in the media space today. So if you tell me that you're going to start um, your own channel, your own YouTube channel, I won't be surprised in a few years you become the leading player because you've got something to reach the target audience in your own authentic way. There's nothing stopping you today. The whole place has been disrupted that anyone today can become a media house. Any one of you can become a media house today. Uh, for example, if you want to set up your own water polo channel and tell people how to play water polo, and then you do it so well. I'll give you an example. There's a guy in the US, um, you know, static jumping, right? Just stump, uh, jumping static. So what he did was he was just practicing in his, in his backyard, just jumping. And then he got really good at it and he started YouTubing it. So 100 people watched it, 1,000 people watched it. And then he thought, you know what? The people, then people are requesting, hey, can you uh, now show us how to do it. He wrote an e-book and put it on online and made $3 million a year. Just teaching people how to jump, lateral jumps. So money opportunities, business opportunities come from everywhere. I've that's why I was be telling you, be creative, right? So the evolution of media allows us to now take away the middleman, which are the broadcasters, and go directly to the consumer today. If you've got something to say, people are willing to listen. So data and uh, analytics. Uh, Moneyball is just half the story. Uh, I don't know if you guys watched the movie Moneyball. Um, yeah, so um, that is a great idea. Um, people who have really harnessed uh, data and got sports performance out of it. But that's half the, uh, half the, the show, really. 
because there's so much more that can be done today, so much more. I know of a, a small Indonesian company that sta started its own data tracking. So they track um, sp uh, football movements. They come up with stats, like live stats. Just a, a small company now that's become large because they had passion in data and, and al analytics. Right? So this is another space that's really going to grow. There are huge players in the marketplace today, like Catalyst and Opta and all these guys, who are now giving real-time performance and data to fans to consume. So that's another great place to get into. Game day innovation. So I've been personally passionate about match day revenues um, because I, I always look at how can I now sort of innovate. So in, in the US especially, people like Uber and Amazon Prime, they partner with many um, companies, many clubs, many leagues to say how can they Im increase the, the fan experience. The fan experience is more, more, most important because they are the people who are paying. How can you enhance all that? So game day innovations is another place that, that it's a trend, it's a growing, growing place that you can actually might want to look into. AR and VR. AR is augmented reality, VR is virtual reality. Um, so these are two things that are really happening. Now what is the future is going to happen is that, excuse me, is that you can be sitting at home at 3 o'clock in the morning, you wake up from your bed, you put on this goggle, and all of a sudden you are at the Bernabeu Stadium or the New Camp or Old Trafford. And then you can have this 360 view about the match that's happening, you can listen to everything, and the next thing you turn around, your friend sitting next to you in the corporate box. That's the future, vir vir virtual reality. People are already testing the space, right? So this, this is something that uh, we got involved in the early stage of uh, virtual reality, but cost a lot of money to develop and, and nurture and get, get to a space, but that is what the future is. We are now experimenting AR with one of our own products, our own products that we are going to launch. When they open up a box, the app scans and, and the video pops up and say, hey, thanks for subscribing to this membership and stuff like that. So you can be creative in the sense and you can give this experience to your consumers now directly using technology. <coughs> uh, greater emphasis on brand protection. All the more today, um, just last week there was an article, interesting article about how many people are going to do ambush marketing or guerrilla marketing for the FIFA World Cup. Uh, people are going to leverage, they're going to try and ambush and uh, leverage on what's going to happen with the World Cup. So there are people going around now also being a police, like telling FIFA for a fee that who's uh, misusing their trademarks. So people have created another business out of it, right? Um, so you can see that there's a greater emphasis on, on, on protection of brands today around the world. Also, there's a common belief that the big boys have the monopoly. They monopolize everything, right? Uh, it's not true. The marketplace is so huge, they can't be in every vertical, in every corner, and every business. They just can't. Like I told you earlier, well, when we were starting our business, we stayed close to our competition. We stayed close to the big boys because uh, they started handing out our businesses. No matter how big they are in, the dis in this space, they cannot monopolize everything. It's not physically possible. It's not humanly possible. Um, so get that out of the head and thinking that you know the opportunities are plenty. It's up to you on how creative you can be. Profitable bi uh, business myth, people have this idea that uh, you have no boss, which is not true. Your staff are your boss, your clients are your boss, your vendors are your boss. Uh, you're the last guy to get paid, right? So, so you have a boss. You, you can work a few hours. Okay, this, this beautiful idea of only working for four hours a, a week or a day, uh, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, happen. I'm usually the first one or, uh, and the last one to leave in the office. When I'm not the first one, I'm definitely the last one to leave the office unless I have a meeting and I've been going that for, for years. I still get out of bed the same way I got out of bed 10 years ago, 15 years ago, with the same passion, with the same drive. The only thing I think about is business. The only thing I think about is the sports business. So there's no such thing as because you become a sports entrepreneur, you sports business owner, you, you're going to have a few, few hours off. Your minions will take care of the details. Um, you can't leave your business to the hands of uh, your staff. Because at the end of the day, they are looking to you for direction. They are looking to you to be one chapter ahead of them. Um, as the leader of the business, it's your duty. The buck stops with you, not with them. So don't leave everything to your minions. Make sure that you instruct and lead properly. Uh, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat its part to your door. Like, okay, I set up a business, I sit back, and now I think about the money rolling in. No, it doesn't happen like that. 
the, the, like I said earlier, you need to be a marketer, you need to be the sales guy, you need to be the guy that's cleaning the toilet. I, I kid you not, this is what I used to do. I used to, some days still today, on a Sunday, I come back to the office and I walk around and, and I look around the table. I look at everybody's table and I look at everything. Um, some days I clean the rubbish, I, I get a feel of what the business is, I get the feel of what people are thinking, what they are doing. And when we used to have 30, 40 people in the office, I used to look at everyone's table and how they kept it because that reflected their work, their mentality, their attitude towards uh, to, to, to their job. So I, I was detailed about everything in that sense. I was watching people, um, even looking at their social feed, what they, are, what they are up to, because this is a team. Um, if that guy is feeling bad from a weekend breakup, I can't be harsh on him. Or if he just had a baby, I need to be the first one to congratulate him on his birthday and stuff like that. That all comes with the leadership. And, and that will help you now get your product better to the marketplace because you can't do everything on your own. Um, that you have more in, uh, control over your income. That's one thing for sure I can tell you that as an entrepreneur, that you have no control over your income. One day is going to be great and the other day is going to be down and you're going to have a great day and you're going to have a very bad day and you've got to be prepared for that. you really got to be prepared for that. You've got to mentally be prepared that this is not a, a venture that's going to be smooth sailing all the way. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, in the first three years, I did not take a salary. I did not have one cent as salary accrued to me. I was just living on expense. Bang, left to right, left to right, left to right. Fourth year, got paid a little bit. Fifth year, things got better. And then from there onwards, I started paying myself a salary. So you've got to be prepared for that. And a lot of the times, be because of the peer pressure that's around you, and then you go, you know what, this is too much, let me go and get a job. Uh, the fact of the matter, even some days, I even now I think about it. Why do I need all this? Let me get a job. Uh, but then I wake up and say, no, no, I just want to have that chase, right? So you need to be prepared for that mentally. Investors will throw money at your great idea, right? Uh, not too long ago, um, we were trying to raise money for a, for a great product in my mind, but just couldn't. Everything, when we sat in front of uh, investors, they like, oh, this is great, this is good, you got everything, your marketplace is great, you did a great business plan, you got the ideas and everything. But when it came to, like I said, okay, great, give me the money, nobody wanted to give me the money. So that is something that you need to be prepared. Uh, there was once I, um, before I sold our part of our business to the Japanese conglomerate, I probably met about 40 different uh, investor groups, 40 different investor groups pitching, I was telling, I was pitching, I was telling because uh, that's the only way you learn, right? You, one day I sat in front of 15 people and they were grilling me. I, I, when I walked out of, the, of, the, of their office, I couldn't, I couldn't walk because I was physically, ex mentally exhausted. I couldn't walk, so I had to sit down for a while and regroup myself. But they were throwing things at me that I never, never learned, I never was exposed to. And I had to go back and reflect and say, okay, how can I be better? So at the 40th time is when I found my partners and I was precise. I knew exactly what to say. I knew exactly what they were looking for. I had the language, I had the knowledge, I had the everything that came along. But that was because I had 40 different failures before that. Right, so. Determination can uh, overcome any obstacle. Yeah, it's true. I mean, everybody wants to be determined and determination is part of it. Uh, but don't forget that you need to keep that going. There must be a purpose behind it. Uh, blind determination gets you nowhere, right? Some days you just need to know that, hey, this is not working out for me. Game over, I need to move. But determination is one thing that will take you somewhere. Uh, by taking big risks, you set yourself up for big rewards. Uh, um, you need to take some sort of risk in life to get ahead. But if you leap with the big risk, then you're asking for trouble, <laughs> right? You don't sell your house, your car and everything and say, I'm going to dump everything into making this business work. Because if it doesn't, you lose your life, right? So I wouldn't recommend it. What I would really do is that Calculated risk, right? Limited risk. You take on your risk that you can sort of um, stomach, you can lose. I think that's a bit more calculated, that's a bit more palatable. Okay, now the interesting part. So let's think about some ideas that we can talk about. Sunday leaks, okay, some business ideas. New website, right? Camps and clinics, online shops, talent manager digital marketing, sponsorship marketing, promotions, facilities. 
So I've listed out some um, ideas that I think it's a, a very easy, uh, e uh, well, uh, easier entry to sports business. Uh, stuff like Sunday leagues. You can now set up your own amateur league, right? Whether it's for kids, for amateurs, for adults, for women, uh, for corporates, uh, for a certain niche, sector, schools, whatever. You can now think about where you have the most leverage on and you can go after it. Uh, news website, are you an expert on something? Is it football, golf, um, motorsports, tennis, water polo, whatever it is? Are you, are you an expert in that? Can you now create content out of that? Can you curate content out of that and set up a website on the site, a blog on the site, some video content on the site? Then you can monetize with advertising later on. Can you do that? What about clinic and, uh, clinics and camps? Right? So sports clinics are really popular. Um, parents really want the kids to be outdoors. Um, could it be an adventure camp, adventure clinic, swimming, water pool, whatever you think your, your niche is, your interest is, you can set that up. Online shops, um, have you got some memorabilia that is unique, collector's item? Now you can put it, put it in the marketplace. Or you can go around the world looking for those stuff and you now sell those stuff online. Because you are a curator, you are a content creator of that, and you're telling a story to sell the content. So content to commerce. So that's another opportunity. Talent manager, like we said, you want to be a football agent, you want to be a football scout, um, various things. Now they have uh, scouts for basketball as well. They have basketball agents, whatever you want to be. You think that you're a best man manager, you've got great HR skills, why don't you try that? Digital marketing, that's another prep space that's really, really growing. All clubs, leagues, players, you name it, organizations, they need digital expertise today. They need it. It's, it's not a luxury, it's a must. Because if they want to reach out to the marketplace, that's what they need. They need to be creating their own CRM, their own database now, uh, newsletters, podcasts. They need all of that. So if you've got that kind of skills, you become really valuable now. Sponsorship marketing, how can you help sell sponsorship? Um, going to an organization and say, hey, you're not leveraging on the assets that you have. Uh, can we help you? You've got a great facility. Can we sell the naming rights for this? Um, you've got... Uh, six or seven players that are really popular and have great social media accounts. Can we now package all of them and, and, and sell an endorsement to a Pepsi or a Coke or whatever? That's another opportunity. Promotions. You want to be a boxing promoter? You want to promote Muay Thai or mixed martial arts? Or you want to promote a yoga event or a CrossFit event? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. You think about your own niche and say, I want to create a one-off promotion event. And facilities, like I said, uh, is becoming uh, a really popular place multi-sports facility. You can set up a futsal court or a batting cage or a tennis uh, a golf simulation. So y you can use your own imagination in your own field and your own expertise on that. But these are some ideas that you can enter fairly quickly and not really a lot of comp while there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of need as well. Uh, you can argue that there are a lot of camps, a lot of clinics, but how can you make it special? How can you put your own spin to it? How can you bring your own network into it? So validating a business idea is very, very important, like we spoke earlier. Uh, conduct the, the macro test, uh, market side trends, search volume. Um, is there an upward trend in search volume, industry growth related to your idea? So today, the, the internet allows you to do that. In keywords, um, industry, uh, trade, you can subscribe to many things. If you want to, for example, be in the sponsorship space, uh, Asia Sponsorship Network is one that you know, gives you resource on who's actually spending, who's not spending, where, where, where are the growth areas. You can Google it and see how much search volume actually comes out of it. Uh, it's all there. Uh, can you find existing players in your marketplace that are really, really doing well to demonstrate there's a need, indeed market demand? For example, I said there's a lot of um, um, soccer clinics maybe, uh, clinics, but you can see that uh, they only have X amount of inventory they can take. Right? That's becoming parents would want their kids to be more outdoors. What are they looking for? What are they searching for? Go on the internet and find out. Go to Quora, uh, use keyword search, what the parents are looking for, especially in the sports space. And then you try and fill that gap. Right? It could be medical, like how to um, bond better with your kids or how to know that my son is not getting injured. I mean, it really depends on a lot of things that you can now start imagining using the marketplace, harnessing the power of the internet to create that research. So are there meaningful differences between what's in the market and what you're thinking, offering? We don't, um, 
we don't know what for sure yet, but seems to be a good I enough idea for now. What does it really mean? It's like you feel you feel that you got an idea. It's good enough for now. Uh, what do you need to do next? What do you really want to do next? Uh, then you think about is there is there a real difference between what I'm offering and what the guy is offering? It's like would you start uh, a Western restaurant next to another Western restaurant? You just won't do that, right? Uh, you won't do identical things. Maybe your menu might change, your branding might be different, but you won't do the same thing. So which is what we say. If the idea is that you think, if somebody is running this and there's overwhelming response, I know a football academy that bring, brings in revenue about $2 million a year, a football academy. And they do it really well. And their branding is great. They do great stuff. They do great events. Uh, nobody imagined a football academy can gross over $2 million a year. So there is a marketplace. So it's but now how you approach it. You see what they're doing, can I be different? Can I appeal to a different group? And then validate that. Um, conduct a micro test, um, smaller group. It must be hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, typo there, hand-to-hand, hand-to-hand battle. Meaning to say, I also read a very good article about a lady who, was, who, who wanted to start an organic coffee, uh, out of the sports business, digress a little bit. She wanted to start an organic coffee business. So what she did, she hung out at, at Starbucks, right? She went to random strangers every day, 20 strangers every hour, asking them how Starbucks can actually, and the experience with the coffee, and how Starbucks can actually uh, uh, improve on their coffee. So she got all this data, sh because she didn't go anywhere else. She just went there. She knew coffee was her place, and she went there. And she started asking all sorts of questions. She started asking all sorts of questions, and she realized that um, she, people were saying that the, the coffee is too acidic or too whatever, and then she started to rework. She took all of that data and said, okay, now I want to start an organic coffee. This is what I want to do, right? So she sort of took the information and made it her own. Same thing. If you want to start an amateur league for baseball, right? Look at how somebody is doing. Go hang around there, macro, macro level, and start talking to them. What is missing? What is the experience that's missing? I'll give you an example. Years ago, when I used to run a football academy for two years, I... I had the kids playing. There were a lot of mothers there and fathers there. Then I was always thinking, how can I enhance their experience? Two hours of sitting around doing nothing is, can be uh, quite dangerous for me because they might decide not to come anymore, right? So I said, how can I do that? So I sort of leveraged it and I went to a yoga teacher and said, how much does it cost for me to hire you? He says, uh, $80 a session or $100 a session. Back then, I can't remember. I said, okay, come. So I went there and I ad advertised to my group. There were like 30, 40 moms. I said, we're going to do a yoga class. Ten dollars a pop, right? So everybody's like, "Yeah, I'm sitting around ten dollars. Why not?" So what I did, I paid the lady eighty to hundred dollars, and I kept everything for myself that I could pay for some of the um, other expenses. The mothers were happy because they were practicing yoga; they were doing something. Then I created a little corner for the dads with newspaper, coffees, and stuff like that, nice sofa. So they they sort of enjoyed the the experience, the ambience. So I created different experiences for people. So. The next term, I got flower arrangement and stuff like that. So you need to be a little bit creative on how you, you do that. And, but that also gave me an opportunity to bond with them. Ask them, hey, what's wrong? What can I do better? And the yoga idea actually came out of one of the ladies. Uh, and they said, oh, if I can do something while I'm here. So I took the feedback and actually executed something. So I, my retention was higher. And not many kids then started dropping off, so which, was, which was great for business. Right, so to validate the idea, there are certain ways you can actually do. The, but the best place is to ask your potential customers what they want, right? It's whether you, when you give them the idea, they say, yeah. And when you tell them, pay now, if they say, are they really willing to pay, then you've got a great idea. So that brings me to the end of this little training. Uh, we'll use the next maybe half an hour for questions. Feel free to shoot whatever questions I'm happy to answer. I'm sure you've got full of questions, right? I think that's something that you can't prevent. Um, that's something that uh, you have to be ready because it's such a global pl marketplace. But what's something called a market leader? You've got, you, you, you got to be the first to market. 
And then you need to think about your own product, how you're going to affect people. How you can only control what's within your control. You cannot control who comes into the marketplace. You just can't. But you can control how, what kind of experience you put out, what kind of product you put out, and how you want to follow through with the people, your, your tribe, your people that follow you, and how, what kind of experience and how you want to retain them. That you can decide. So I would say pay more attention to that rather than thinking, how do I protect my business from the, from the market forces? Because you can take every measure humanly possible, but it's not going to help you long term. It's just not going to help you. But I think what you need to do is that that's when I think relationships really count. I, I'll give you an example. With when I started at my, my, my football academy, I was actually entering a very crowded market space. Um, the demographics was a, a little bit different in mine. Because I, I went for a specific group. My messaging was specific. My training was specific. My location was specific to attract the, that kind of crowd that I wanted. Of course, there were a group that was taking care of the expats, there was a group that was taking care of the, of the local base, but I was very specific about who I, I wanted to go after, and I tra started attracting that kind of uh, uh, um, people, and then from there, it became a bit like a word of mouth, because they are going there, they put the, so they brought the same demographic of people into the marketplace. So I think whatever you're looking to launch, uh, don't pay too much attention to who's going to come and take your, your place, more to say how can you strengthen your place. Yeah. So yes, I think for the start when you do a water bowl training, let's say I think it will probably be worth uh, as a start there itself. It will, have, it will be the a level where most people in Singapore will actually benefit from learning from us. But then I think, so what I had in mind was that what stopping someone from let's say the world champion country, the Serbia or Croatia will come down and do the exact same thing and, and you know like have more so credibility. So the, the advantage you have is that you know the local land better, right? Your network is stronger than a guy coming from Serbia. I can even straight away think of language is going to be an issue. Because the demographics you're going to go after speak the same language as you. Right? Whoever comes from overseas, that's going to be a barrier. Of course, the credibility might be different. The product might be completely different. But again, I think you should pay attention on leveraging on your strength rather than thinking about what else is going to come into the marketplace. Because then you don't leap. You'll never make that transition because you're worried about what's coming next. Right? You're always looking over your shoulder. I think more importantly to see how can you leverage that you being a national player, people know you, people trust you, you have more credibility than a guy coming from Croatia, even uh, Serbia, no matter what he's done. Uh, and then you know the, the marketplace well, because you could do a very profitable clinic as compared to someone like him, right? So let's just say you can afford to charge $200 a session, just arbitrary. Him flying all the way from Serbia can't charge $200. Just economically, it doesn't work, right? So he's going to charge maybe, say, 400 twice your price. While the perceived value of his might be bigger, the marketplace can't accept a $400. He's going to get fewer people, but you got this consistent thing of keeping your price consistent, your service consistent, everything consistent. And then you always have an edge over there. But one-off things actually, I mean, one-off things do happen. I'm not saying that you're not going to lose one-off, but it's about when you're focused on your product for the long term, all of these small things just happen by the way kind of thing. Yeah. It's not really going to impact your business in long term. Other questions? I mean, the list of these uh, business ideas in like Sunday League, all these like, okay, I think generally, okay, these are all obviously good ideas, but let's say in a country with a very amateur background, right? So like uh, where people are just not used to paying much for sport or even wanting to pay for sports where like, Amateur is really amateur to them. It's like you know, it's like a free play where you just uh, have, have fun together in a in a public void deck or a basketball court. So how do you make such uh how do you especially in a country like Singapore where we, we are basically for so how do you make such thing uh monetize such a thing? Okay, I I'll 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 give you an example. Um, today there are about three hundred thousand. I'm just going to talk about football because that's the space I know well. Yeah. There are about three hundred thousand amateur footballers in Singapore. You never imagine. I, I mean, I never thought that kind of numbers. There are maybe at least 10 thriving amateur leagues at multiple level with like six or seven divisions. Uh, some of my uh, our guys used to play, and I know a lot of people who play. In. Um, um, and, and they are thriving. They are thriving. So I it's about, again, I will go back to an idea on uh, what you serve is not for everyone. What you sell is not for everyone. You just need to be a hero for one. Don't try to be a hero for everybody. 
you don't start a league and say I want to do a uh, league for this, league for that, league for that, because then you stand for don't stand for anything. I think you need to go into a specialist area, say, I'm going to start a league for kids, this age group to this age group, and I'm going to be the best at it, and you've got to invest your time and effort and getting your network into that. I want to be a, a Sunday Warrior League expert. That means I'm s going to places where these guys hang out, already playing in other leagues, going there to say, hey, by the way, uh, doing your market research, right? You say, you play in this league, what can be improved in this league? They're going to say better lights, better timing, better referees. They're going to they're gonna give you a bunch of things. People are, are, are happy to complain, right? Because you're going there to find out what, 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 what is lacking. So they're going to give you a hundred things that you can actually improve on. You take it back and then now you make an economical um, decision about this now. Say, if I put a better referee, if I put better lights, if I put this, put that, will I be able to package it and give it to them? And what will my messaging be to them? Are you tired of playing in poor t at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're burning yourself to death? Or, or are you tired of not playing under flight lights or have poor amateur referees? So this come becomes your marketing message, right? And say, how about playing at a, a 7 o'clock kickoff and feel like a national team player? Example. Uh, you, you know what I mean? So it's about how you shape your product and how you position yourself. I think that makes a big, big difference. But that can only happen if you ask the customer what they want. If, if you start making up the mind for them, then it's not going to happen. Then you produce it and nobody comes. Like you will, you will launch it and you say, and then you say, you hear the cri uh, crickets, crick, 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 how come nobody come? I got a great product. Because you're not filling the marketplace. You're not asking what they want and not giving them what they want. The easiest thing to do in business after many, many years, I realized, is actually ask, <laughs> which is something so simple. And if I can go back in time, uh, that's what I'll do. I'll go and ask what's missing. I'll go in a very non-threatening ma ma manner and ask them what their current vendor or your competition in the marketplace or whoever is actually doing, what are they doing wrong and what can be improved? And there's your answer for a product. I think that is, that, is, that is the first start you can ever do in business. So go and you look at your competition, you look at your marketplace, you look at what's ever ha whatever's happening. I told you about standing next to your competition, right? Same thing. Look at your competition, go there, pay attention, open your eyes and, and, and learn. You're not going there to badmouth them and say, hey, don't join the league, join my league. No, that's not your point. Your point is market intelligence. Go there, be a participant. If you have to be, go and learn. Speak to the guy, say, hey, yeah, what do you think? Ah, no, because this is a problem, this is a problem. Come back and, you, and that's your research. That's your product waiting to be launched. That's your, that's your marketplace. Because once you have that, you fill the gap, then your marketing message res resonates with them, they're going to come for you. Questions? Guys, I've, I, I, I've packaged 15 years of experience, so feel free to ask me anything, right? So this, uh, generally, I, I, I would charge anywhere between three to $5,000 for this sort of, this is what we call a masterclass, that you learn, completely learn from me. So I've, I've basically, I've given it to you for free because I'm testing this, um, obviously recording for, for, for video, for my courses, but I'm happy to share. I think uh, life only rewards people who share, and I'm a big believer of that. So and, and I have friends here, I don't know, like Kiki, yeah? came all the way from Indonesia to learn. So feel free, don't be shy to ask. <laughs> they look like a Formula One jersey, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Even Formula Jersey is better for them. But how do you in take in somebody that is very nice clean, but can be Okay, so there's no magic pill to that. I, I won't I, I don't have one answer to it because if I did, I'll be the richest agency on on, 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 on earth, right? Uh, the thing is a lot of um, a lot of thing goes into um, getting uh, a sponsor on board whether they are already traditionally in sports or not. Um, also depends a lot on how the, the CMO feels. After the CMO the, or Chief Marketing Officer or how the, 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 the CEO, this is 15 years of me just doing this, meeting people, trying to sell sponsorship and pitching at every level with different countries, right? Uh, I realized that 
we might have the best product. You might really hit the demographics they are asking. You, you can put everything that you, they want in front of them. Uh, and if you've been doing it as long as I have been, you've probably learned a few lessons along the way and you try and shape it, right? But no matter how, how, you, how great a product you bring in front of a, a sponsor, it really depends on what their objective is. And those objectives are not public. It's only internal because it's a strategy that they don't say out because then that keeps them the edge against their competitors. And it's a, a lot of the time a hit and miss and sometimes it's a lot of relationships. Like for example, if I know a brand, um, um, let's say, just say one of my, my, my long time clients are, are, are is Canon. So when I, when, I, when I take them out for casual, uh, casual dinners or lunch or drink or whatever, that's where I get my gather my intelligence. Uh, that's where you should be looking to gather your intelligence. So it's a relationship knowing what direction they're going to take in the next six months, eight months. Even a non-brand, right? Uh, it's about casting the white as w uh, net as wide as possible and then trawling back whatever comes in. And that takes time. And it's not a, a, a magic pill, a simple one solution and say, okay, you know what, I'm going to say a few words that they're all going to be mesmerized and they're going to put the money in spot. Doesn't happen, unfortunately. Even the best of the best sponsorship sellers in the world will tell you the same problem. Right place, right time, right fit. Uh, so all of this got to align properly. And in, in the sponsorship, one of the things that really helps is time. You need to give people at least six to eight months of run, run time because decisions, the bigger the company, the more time they need to, to decide. Yeah. Exactly. Because sometimes they may b you, what you might not know is that they already committed their, their budgets to other projects, which they usually sometimes don't tell you. Because if they tell you, then say, okay, then you, you might end up asking, well, what, 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 what campaign is it? And they can't expose, right? So sensitive information, open, open information. So it's a multitude of different things coming together, not approving it. But at the same time, I've had also um, huge success in, in, in bringing sponsors on board where I felt, I felt that, you know what, it's not going to happen. Then you get a call and they say, hey, yeah, we're in, you know. Uh, maybe it doesn't even meet their, their objective. Uh, they don't have the budget. They give a call to the president and the president says, yeah, I think I like this. Let's go. Happens. Yeah. So I think along the way, you need to make those relationships. Um, uh, there's something that we, we talk about here as well. You need to think about your dream 100 clients. Think about the dream 100. 100 people that you really feel that you want to form a relationship with, uh, they are my ideal clients. Like you say, okay, these are the brands that I, over the years, but must become my clients. Then you market against them. And you try and build relationships against them. Right? So um, that, that's how you, you start that, right? And it's not a one-off process. You pick up the phone and say, I am Kiki from, from my agency, and hey, I want to sell a sponsorship to you. How does that sound? sounds one-off, right? Very, very but because you've been sending him emails and you've been send adding value to him by, hey, you know, this is what your competition did. Oh, hey, congrats that you launched this, you know. So you build a relationship over time and you say, you know what, I happen to be in your area, what about a coffee? He or she might say no the first time. Two weeks later, you ask again, might say no. But at the third time, you say, oh my God, this guy. <laughs> then when you go there, you're not being a, a creep by saying, hey, asking all these questions, you just be cool about it, right? Hey, I, you know, this is what we do. I see if there's anything that we can do. And then they come into say, is, is it okay if I now start sending you newsletters or podcasts of the stuff we do? Is it okay? Yes. Then they come into your system, which is what we are doing, right? So we create this top of mind without being creepy, right? We're adding value. We're sending them podcasts, great podcasts, great, great content in the marketplace. We're sending them newsletters that they are reading and say, oh, these guys are adding value. So you don't become a creep, you become an uh, asset. Exactly. Yeah. So multiple forms of education anyway. That's a good question, but tough one, yeah. Okay. So, um, I believe that, uh, again, the um, Facebook is a great way to reach now. Uh, for the cost per, cost per reach, it's becoming less, lesser, but with the new algorithms, maybe it might be a bit more. Anywhere between $1 to $3, you can reach anyone, right? Uh, that's what we uh, try to achieve. We try to bring it to $1 to reach someone. And um, it's, again, driving cold traffic into the, 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 the top of the funnel by giving a bit of free um, information. 
so like a lead magnet. Um, like for example, this uh, introduction to sports business, it'll be like, find out 10 tips on how to set up your business tomorrow, your sports business. It could be a it could be a blog. It could be a a, a piece of video from my course. Okay. The, maybe the juice we we sort of uh, compress all the best bits of this whole thing, and I I will play it out as an ad. And then what we can do is that we drive engagement on the video. Once we drive engagement on the video, we can now pixel them. Then they come into our funnel now, and then we give them drip uh, emails with content, content, content. Because the way we buy today is that we don't buy at the first instance. We really don't, right? So what happens is that, have you ever, I mean, I'm sure because you're a digital marketer, you know this, you clicked on an ad and the ad seems to be following you around everywhere, right? It's omnipresent, right? It's everywhere, omnichannel, right? So I think that's how the sale is done and that's how we intend to do it because the other part of our business, we, we are perfecting that art in terms of uh, Digital Repub Republic. We're actually s putting our own money into advertising, not clients' money, our own money to learn. And we're also creating our own products to learn how to sell. Uh, and we are now packaging our own uh, courses to sell, but the strategy is the same. Uh, we give away uh, free education to bring people into our, our system, our funnel, what we call our sales funnel, and we, we then retarget them with ads that are going to add value to them. And it's not spamming them, right? So if they took the first part of the course on how to start their business, so the next video could be, what's your next step? The third video could be, what's the next step after that? And after that, they say, hey, do you, now that you have seen enough, and by the time you build that credibility, you build that trust with them, and then they're ready to pull the trigger to buy the, the course at the end. Uh, so, yeah, so that's what we do. Uh, that's how we, we, we intend to sell. Uh, this is not, I mean, this is the start of the first course, but what I intend to do is that um, with this course, with the how to start the sports agency business, then I also want to do a master class like this, uh, a smaller group where I work with them over six weeks to actually launch, the, launch their business, validate their business idea, so like I said, if I was starting in 2005, I wouldn't mind paying $5,000 for a mentor who actually teaches me because I lose less money. I, I mean, I, I might have invested 5000 I my acceleration could have been faster. I would have taken the route 100%, but I didn't have that opportunity. And uh, I mean, the reality is 15 years ago when I went to the likes of uh, the telcos of the world and I said, uh, sports marketing, they're like, huh, what? What's sports marketing? Because everything is in one bucket of communication. They didn't realize that uh, sports marketing was a specialist area. Because sports consumers are not consumers, they are fans. It's a different thing altogether. You go to the supermarket, you just buy one. Sports is not like that. Your heart is involved in something. So much so that if you are a Liverpool fan with Carlsberg, you don't drink Tiger beer. That's how people are, you know? So, uh, I mean, we go to marketplaces like Indonesia, they are fanatical. People die during games, you know? So they are not just normal consumers. They, they are emotionally attached to something. So marketing to that becomes very specialist. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yep. Yeah. Hundred percent. I think sponsorship is a is a, mi uh, a common um, misunderstanding that is only for the big boys, right? Of course, if you're looking at the Olympics, the Asian Games, and all the big, of course, you got to go with the big uh, blue chip companies. They have that marketplace. But if you are sponsoring a little league in your neighborhood or your 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 community, that doesn't need a lot of money. But your neighborhood business, your small SME, now can leverage on supporting a a little league team or a little league, like a, your Sunday league. Because these guys are the potential customers. So because they are a sponsor, now they have the database, they can run promotions against them, they can say, hey, come to my restaurant and eat, you get 50% because you're playing in this league. In the end, they might probably end up putting $10,000 for the whole season. So SMEs can be involved, but there's a common belief that, I mean, again, the marketplace doesn't allow that, and the common belief that you've got to spend millions of dollars before you get that. Sponsorship also doesn't mean just monetary sponsor, it could be CSR, it could be a corporate social responsibility. Like um, you sponsor uh, 15 coaches to be educated. This brand, this small uh, medium enterprise, um, now en empowers 15 coaches in the neighborhood to become qualified. And they are paying for the, for, for the courses. So now what they have is the brand affinity all of a sudden. 
So the entry to become a sponsor is at different level, different tiers, and I think the marketplace is not educated, and that's the reason why you don't see a lot of SMEs in there. But the answer to that is absolutely. I mean, you can buy in a sponsorship as low as $2,000, uh, up to $2 million. I'll give you a real life example. When I ran the uh, football academy, we're the only academy in Singapore that are that are $100,000 sponsorship. Okay, I got a pizza company, Canadian 241 Pizza, you guys know that, right? I got them to sponsor um, um, because I said, I went there with a pitch to say, McDonald's, how they grew their brand, is brand with, with, with the young kids, right? When any child sees the M, they know it's French fries. Any child, right? When growing up, when you see M, oh, M McDonald's, right? So the brand affinity, to kids at a very young age, is you grow, they grow up with the brand, right? They grow up with the brand. So I went there and pitched to them and said, no pizza companies in the sports space. Uh, and, and then I said, why don't you start with the young kids? Because what you can do is that now you send the word to them so and you give them discount cards because when they have their birthdays and multiple birthdays, they're going to all start ordering pizzas for their birthday because now you've given them a great experience. So they got actually got in as a sponsor. For a football academy, they put, they put $100,000 a year and eventually became my partner in that as well. Uh, because I spoke a language that they, do, they understood. And the pizza business actually grew by 3 to 4% because they, were, they could track with the codes and stuff like that, right? So what the kids started to do, we even changed the name of the academy to Canadian <coughs> 2 for one Pizza Academy. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean? Which is strange, right? We talked about uh, lending credibility, right? I mean, pizza and football had nothing to do with each other, but they leveraged on that. So I think the, 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 ROI, the ROI for people is if I'm a local supermarket and if I support a football team in the corner, um, um, I'll give you another great example. In, in Japan, uh, there's a J, J2 team called Sagan Toso or something like that. There's a small, very small team. Uh, the town is maybe about 200,000 people, small town. Um, they have uh, almost close to about 100 sponsors. Why? It's because it was all not monetary. They went to a lo local business and say, can you buy 10 tickets? Uh, you become a sponsor. I give you leverage, but 10 tickets they take and say, okay, whoever's coming in, I'm giving it out as part of my promo. People are coming. So they're supporting, they're leveraging on, on uh, uh, um, getting inventory there. So they might have one player come to the shop and say, hey, I'm here to sign, um, sign autograph. So people come there in the shop, they're buying stuff. So ROI is tangible, intangible, right? Uh, you need brand awareness, you do that. If you really want, then you give up coupons, right? Supermarkets, barber shops, whatever. You give up coupons so people can literally come. If they come to your shop to eat uh, a piece of cake, they're not going to sit there. They're going to also buy a Coke or something else, right? And <coughs> eating is not a singular thing. They bring people in. So people need to be very creative about the ROI, what they're going to return. It's, again, it's not a one-stop solution for everything. It's about how smart you become in terms of car carving out that sponsorship for a different client. And at every stage of the brand, they have a different need. And you need to be smart about that. Questions? I suspected nine o'clock exactly. So, uh, yeah. So, guys, again, thank you very much. I hope I added some value to to, to you. And uh, um, if you can really help me um, fill up a, a survey form, I, I, again, I'm asking my marketplace what I want, what 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 I think is good. It's the same survey I'm doing. And uh, the guys will be going around with the, with the camera just getting your thoughts about the, the, the little training. Be as honest as possible. If you think it's rubbish, say it's rubbish. But if you think it adds some value to you, just say it so, so that, um, yeah, so that I, I, I get something on, on record. Yeah? Uh, if you guys don't mind. So I'll, I'll hand out the stuff. Guys, can you guys help me? Just give it up and then. Yeah. That's fine, yeah.